Somebody asked me after the last hour, is it easy for you to preach after Suzanne Whitford sings? I said, anybody can preach after Suzanne Whitford sings. <laughs> That's wonderful, wonderful. In his work, Why Church Matters, the author began one of his chapters with the following true story that came out of his own pastorate. Robert lives in Gilbert, Arizona. He loves life and people and enjoys laughing at himself. He's got a good job, faithfully attends our evangelical church. But if you really want to see Robert get excited, ask him about his Jeep. He'd searched for over two years to find just the right yellow and black Wrangler. It was spotless, he said. It was gorgeous. Once I got the Jeep, of course, I joined the Jeep Club. Robert explained, the local club here has over 1,500 active members. It offers meetings, parties, trail runs, and a website where members can exchange Jeep tips and information. It's an entire Jeep community. Once he became a member of this club, Robert connected with guys who taught him the finer points of four-wheeling. And Robert's commitment only deepened. He said, I was totally hooked. Every free moment was consumed. I was either working on my Jeep, planning a Jeep run, hanging out, talking Jeep, going online to check out our Jeep website and more. Then a conference on the nature and subject of the church began. And Robert realized he had no real passion for the church or its assembly. He said to his pastor, I would do anything for the guys in my club, but I struggle to do anything to serve here. He was challenged with this question at the conference. If the church is central to God's purpose as seen through history and the gospel, how can we take so lightly what God takes so seriously? The author then made this application. We all have our own temptation. We have a temptation that can push the gospel and the church to the outskirts of our lives. And we have our own version of the Jeep Club. Some interest, some pursuit. It might be a hobby, a sport, a career, education. It might be preoccupation with technology, health, a political cause, or even a relationship that pushes the gospel to the side. The signs, he ends with this, of our passionate commitment are already here. We often simply do not recognize them for what they are telling us. Now, I open with that, and, and I don't want you to think this illustration is directed at people who own a Jeep, okay? So if you own a Jeep, don't slink out of the parking lot after. You know, I feel sorry for you that you don't own a pickup truck, but at any rate, you, you got a Jeep. <laughs> Now, frankly, your Jeep might be your children's soccer league. Your, your Jeep might be your garden, uh, your retirement cottage, or a set of golf clubs. What is it that drives the real passion where you light up when you talk? Is any of it spiritually related? A church is a community of believers who effectively promise one another that they are going to accept the reminder of what ought to be the priority in life, to hold ourselves accountable to the gospel and to the call of Christ upon our lives. The church reminds us as we gather that there are things more important than our own version of our Jeep. Now we have begun working through several promises, 20 plus promises that we're making to each other as members of this local assembly. We began last Lord's Day. We've categorized them into three different sections, promises related to our conduct, promises related to our church, promises related to our community, all of them coming from the New Testament pattern that we find. And, and, and let me say this, uh, the promises we talked about last Lord's Day and the promises we're gonna talk about today are for every believer. If you're visiting here from another church or you're listening online in some other state or country, these are for every believer. If you're not a believer, I'm glad you're here or listening. We are putting ourselves as an assembly on notice 
Delivering a message like this puts us all on notice. This is how you should see us live. This is how our unbelieving world should sense our priority. What they should observe in our lives. Now thus far we have covered three promises as it relates to personal conduct. First, the promise to submit to the authority of Scripture as the final authority on all matters. Secondly, we covered this promise, the promise to pursue holiness in all areas of life as a joyful act of worship to our triune God. And then the last one we covered was the promise to avoid sinful habits and entanglements. And we put a few here in the list. Illicit drug use, drunkenness, gossip, gluttony, and all other such sinful uh, behavior taught in Scripture. And, and I made a comment last Lord's Day that if you think it's a little legalistic to add a few things, we took you, if you were here, to list after list, and the lists are rather long, where the Apostle Paul and Peter and others sort of put everything they can think of into the list that would be sinful behavior, so there's no question. Now today, what I want to do is cover the final promises related to our personal conduct, and there are three more. And, and as, as we get ready to do this, let me encourage you, these promises are not something we'll get uh, nailed down perfectly. Um, it isn't something you master. I don't know about you, but, but I love history. And, and that big, fat, orange copy of the history of Western civilization, and I thought I would be teaching that for the rest of my life. Uh, I could read that, and I could study that, and I could memorize it, and I could put that book on a shelf and say, I, I got it. I've got it. Now, on the other hand, Algebra 2, I could work on that and work on that and work on that. In fact, my high school didn't allow me to graduate until I went to summer school to take Algebra 2 all over again. And I had to get at least a D, and I did. I got a D. Did everything I could to get that, by the way. I wasn't slouching. I was, I was struggling. And got into college on, on um, uh, what's it called? Um, thank you, probation. Oh, you too. Okay, yes. Pro <laughs> Got into college on probation, and I had to take it over again, and I made a D minus and uh, survived it so I could become your pastor. So I did, I did eventually graduate <laughs> with that. I'll, I'll never say I'll master that, but I'll tell you this. This book you never will. None of us. And that's why you, you, if you're old enough in the faith, you realize you've gone back to that verse now for the 12th time, and you see something brand new. Oh, wow. I didn't see that there before. That application, that nuance, that meaning, you, you never go, yep, got that, what's next? So when we talk about the promises of the believer's life effectively, we understand that we're going to fail, we're going to stumble, we're going to trip up from time to time, we'll need regular reminders to live lives of, of confession with our Lord, the only mediator between us and God, Christ Jesus. We're going to need reordering of our priorities because we get out of sync and we come and we assemble and we study together during the week perhaps and we have small groups meeting men and, and, and women and all kinds of ministries designed to take the word of, of God to apply it to our lives. What we are saying is that these promises are going to be our pursuit that we light up on these that this is going to be what we want to see as a pattern. And we're deeply grieved when it isn't. This is our passion. We're effectively saying the gospel and the church means more to us than a Jeep or a set of golf clubs or whatever it might be. Here's the fourth promise. To pursue fellowship with Christ and growth in the Spirit of God through diligence in spiritual disciplines, including prayer, Bible study, worship, and service. Again, this language is pointed. We refer to prayer and Bible study and worship and serving our Lord not as spiritual entertainments or spiritual recreations. You notice that? but spiritual discipline. 
We're going to drop in on a number of texts, and you can try to keep up. I'll be here long enough to have you turn to 1 Corinthians. So turn there. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, chapter 9. And I want you to notice how he refers to Christianity as an athletic contest. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26. And I need to go ahead and start reading here. Catch up when you can. But he says this, Therefore I run in such a way, not without aim, I box in such a way, as not beating the air. In other words, I'm not shadow boxing. I'm not punching at the air. But I buffet my body. Now stop. In this one text alone, Paul is relating the Christian life to different sporting events like running and boxing. The Greeks had two great athletic festivals annually the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games were held in Corinth. So when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians and used this analogy, they immediately understood what he was talking about. Every athlete was involved in 10 months of, of, of training. The last month before the contest month, uh, these uh, exercises under supervision would take place in the city of Corinth, in their gymnasium which in these Greek city-states, that was really the central a building around which everything revolved, as well as practicing on the athletic fields and on the track. Then they would, then they would uh, contest uh, athletes from all the city-states in foot races, for instance. This is one of the references he uses here. And uh, the one who won would receive a, a, a wreath. It would be made out of pine twigs and pine needles. In fact, Paul writes in verse 25, if you look up a verse or two, he, he makes the point that that wreath doesn't last. It's perishable. That is, it does what the pine needles do in your backyard. Eventually they turn brown and then wither away. But for the Christian, his reward lasts forever. Then he refers to boxing. The boxing champions in Paul's day were similar to the professional athletes of our day, uh, fame, attention, money, status. And so they probably knew the one who was the reigning champion in some weight division in the games that had just been held. But Paul does something unusual here. He, he turns it. He effectively says that the Christian isn't running a race against others. He isn't saying, okay, beat all the Christians you can to the finish line. And then the more you beat, the more you can feel good about yourself. No, he's talking about running against yourself. And then with boxing, it's a little more clear. He said here in verse 27, I buffet my body. The word buffet means to hit under the eye. It's a reference to giving someone a black eye. But Paul was saying, I'm effectively giving myself black eyes. I'm buffeting my body. In other words, I am training and disciplining my own body in order to bring my lazy, undisciplined desires into and under self-control by means of the Spirit of God. Paul wrote along these same lines to Timothy in his first letter. In chapter 4 where he says, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Train yourself. I love that. It comes from the word gumnas. It gives us our word gymnasium. In other words, your pursuit of godliness has the image and it would have in their minds of going into the gymnasium and working up a sweat. He says, go into the, into the gymnasium and work up a spiritual sweat from a good workout. Listen, if somebody says to you, you know, memorizing the Bible is hard. Memorizing passages of Scripture is hard. Praying is hard. Studying the Bible is hard. You can tell them you are obviously doing it right. Because it is a discipline and it involves diligence. And when you're heading in the right direction, it's hard. And you're working up a sweat. Good for you. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and I love his realistic language where he says, 
while presenting to us the goal, he said, we are trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Ephesians 5.10. I love that. We are trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. One author wrote it this way when he defined spiritual disciplines. He said, spiritual disciplines are those exercises that free us from the gravity pull of our present age. Gravity never stops pulling. And it doesn't pull you up. It pulls you down. These exercises are designed with diligence and sweat to free us from that pull every day as we try to learn what is pleasing to our Lord. Promise number five. We promise to practice sexual purity before marriage and complete fidelity within heterosexual and monogamous marriage. Now, my grandfather could have had in his church covenant the same promise, but he didn't need to use nearly as many words as we have. And every word is freighted for our culture and our world. I couldn't help but go back in my mind to one short story that I have read, perhaps you have too, written in 1820. Washington Irving wrote the short story. In fact, it was his first one. It became so immensely popular that we're reading it a couple hundred years later, nearly. In fact, you'll, you've read it too. Let's see how long it takes before you figure it out. It's a story about a man who walked into the woods one day with his favorite rifle and his favorite dog. He met some strange men deep in the forest that gave him a strange tasting Brew, And within a matter of moments, under the influence of that magical brew, he fell into a deep sleep that would last for 20 years. And that man's name was Rip Van Winkle. 20 years later, he awakens and he hurries back into town, none the wiser, only to discover that everything has changed. He went back to the tavern inn where he used to sit and talk to his friends underneath a sign that had a painting of King George III. Now it had the portrait of a different George he didn't understand. Let me read you Washington Irving's own words. In the place of his friend, who once ran the tavern, was a lean-looking fellow with his pockets full of handbills, haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens, elections, members of Congress, liberty, and Bunker's Hill, which bewildered Van Rinkle. The appearance of Rip, with his long grizzled beard, his rusty rifle, his strange dress, soon attracted the attention of the tavern politicians. They crowded around him, eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity. One man bustled up to him and, drawing him partly aside, inquired, On which side did you vote? Another short, busy little fellow pulled him by the arm and, rising on tiptoe, inquired in his ear, Are you a federal or a Democrat? Eventually, they all demanded who he was. Rip exclaimed, at which end, Well, I'm not myself. I was myself last night, but I fell asleep on the mountain, and now everything's changed. During one long 20-year nap, his world had indeed changed. Washington Irving closed by writing, It was some time before he could be made to comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his sleep. How that there had been a revolutionary war, that the country had thrown off the yoke of old England, and that instead of being a subject of His Majesty George III, he was now a citizen of this United States under the presidency of George III. Washington. Can you imagine such breathtaking change in 20 years? You can, can't you? In the past 20 years, we have experienced seismic shifts away from any semblance of a Christian worldview that is now long forgotten. 
to a man-centered, relativistic, subjective, pagan worldview. It's still struggling with the nuances of Scripture, but it is rewriting them as fast as it can. Perhaps unlike any other arena of life, the arena of sexual ethics, sexual relationships, marriage, and now gender have morphed into unrecognizable patterns that are based entirely upon your whim and belief. No longer going back to the created order of God. Time Magazine last month blazed the question on its front cover, is monogamy over? And one of the authors they asked to give his opinion wrote, quote, monogamy is unnatural, but we should keep it for our kids' sake. If you just woke up after a 20-year nap, or maybe you're wanting to go back to sleep, the cultural understanding of marriage has been reduced to mean virtually nothing simply because the argument for same-sex marriage is the same argument for polygamy, group marriage, and more. Your subjective feelings of love determine now what is marriage. Consider how long it will take for other laws to fall out of favor in our cultural consensus. Currently, it's against the law to marry someone in your immediate family. Currently, it's against the law to marry someone who's already married. Currently, it's against the law to alienate the affections of someone's spouse through your own adulterous affection. Currently, it's against the law to marry someone who isn't an adult. And what exactly is an adult? In other words, having redefined marriage as something beyond its biblically and cultural parameters that have been understood for several thousand years, it becomes anything we want it to become, and that means it becomes nothing. Beloved, monogamy is not man's idea. It's God's. Polygamy is man's idea. That's easy to figure out. And let me just address that for the moment because that'll be the next court case. All the way back to the days of Abraham and the patriarchs, their disobedience in multiplying wives brought heartache and division and rivalry and jealousy and war that is continuing to this day. And to this day where fidelity in marriage and monogamy of one man and one woman, covenanting together in faithful union, wherever that standard is eliminated, and you can go to countries where it doesn't exist, look at the results, or where it's ignored, you have incredible travesty. In fact, for one thing, those hurt most will be women and children. Women become collectibles, like property. Travel through world history, Go to countries today where they're struggling to find a man without 15 wives and what that means to that culture. Where women are commodities, not to be cherished and protected, but to be collected and effectively misused, if not discarded. The Bible simply records the polygamy of so many Old Testament Believers, keep in mind that just because the Bible reports something doesn't mean the Bible recommends something. The Bible re recorded that Judas hung himself by the neck. That's not being recommended to any of us either. Just look at what happened to Esther. Look at what happened after she won that contest. And then her husband goes out with another sweep to add to his harem. Look what happened to David. Look what happened to Solomon. You can go to Israel and still see what they call the hill of shame. Look what happened to Hannah and Rebekah. Look at all that it records. Go back, however, in the created order to Genesis chapter 2. And that which is affirmed by Jesus Christ in Matthew 19. Here's the pattern. Here's the created order. That a man shall leave his father and mother 
and shall cleave to his wife, singular, and they, in fact, the man and his wife, it's interesting that Jesus actually emphasized it by saying, and the two shall become one, biologically, physically, spiritually, one. So what are we promising as believers? Something that the church needs to get back to. We're promising fidelity. We're practicing and promising purity. But let me tell you, beloved, you are promising to be viewed in your village like they viewed Rip Van Winkle. You are promising to be perpetually out of date. You are promising to resist the cultural norm. You are promising to accept derogatory and misleading labels. But this is our distinctive. In fact, this is why the New Testament emphasizes over and over and over and over again our sexual conduct, because it is this conduct which is so dramatically different from first century Rome and 21st century America. If you want to be clearly distinctive today in what you believe and what you pursue and what you allow and what you consider pure, the Bible is going to make you very different and at odds with your culture around you that is different today, far different than it was just a few decades ago. But this is a great opportunity for the church. It's a wonderful opportunity for the church. This is why Paul would tell the Romans, let us behave properly in chapter 13. Let, let's not behave in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Let's not make any provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. It's, it's like he's inviting the believer, come on, let's take this opportunity. Surrounded by unbelievers who live this way, let, let's, let's show the difference. He writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, flee immorality. Immorality is any sexual deviation from God's created order. It's a big word, porneo, which, from which we get our word pornography. It involves everything, deviant apart from God's order. He says, flee immorality. And as far as I can think, and I could be wrong, but I thought about it again this week in my study, but I, I think this is, this is the one sin, categorically, that you're actually never told to fight. You're never told to battle it. You're never told to try to overcome it. You're not even told to resist it. You're actually told to run from it. Run from it. Flee immorality. Do you not know, he goes on in verse 19, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. He goes into the slave market of that first century, and he says, look, Christ has gone in to that market, and you are on the auction block, and he bought you. Your body now belongs to him. And one of the best ways you distinguish your life as belonging to him is what you do with your body. So to the Thessalonians, Paul is even more specific. In fact, turn a few pages to the right. Look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's right before 2 Thessalonians. Look at verse 3. I love this clarity. I, and the problem again, beloved, isn't that the Bible just isn't clear. It's just a little fuzzy. No, it's that it's saying something our culture wants to abandon, and it's terribly passionate about rewriting it. Look at this. For this is the opinion of God. Wait. For this is the suggestion of God, if you like it. Hmm. For this is the what? The will of God and your sanctification, which is how you grow spiritually, that you abstain from sexual immorality. 
Fornication, perneo, there's that word again. This broad categorical term that you abstain from any of it. This is the will of God. It's interesting, we now have a dedicated line over at the studios at Wisdom for the Heart, which takes these sermons and puts them on the radio. And uh, was the idea of one of our staff members to just have a dedicated line where people could call in and leave their questions. And I thought, you know, nobody's going to call. And I said, I don't think this is going to work. No, let's try it. And so we tried it. It's now probably the most popular thing we're doing. And we take one Friday a month to answer questions. They simply call in and leave their question and their name, and that's it. It's a joy to respond, by the way, to these questions. And now we have far too many than we could ever begin to answer. Not too long ago, we got a question from a man who called in and said this. I'm living with my girlfriend. I'm a Christian, and she is not. And I'm praying to know what the will of God is. Do you have any idea? I had an idea or two. And so on the radio, answered it. And it was fairly simple. Fairly simple. Move out. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to wonder about it. You don't need to get your Bible out, really. He's already spoken. And if you do want to look at something, there it is. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I gave that verse over the radio. You don't, don't pray. I happened, and I don't really get to say this. I know God's answer for your life. And I got to say it. I know God's answer for your life. Stop it. Move out. In fact, what a tragedy that this girl who is not a believer is living with you, compromising as a believer. Why would she ever want to give her life to Christ? What does she see in you? This is the will of God. Look at verse 4. That each one knows how to possess his own vessel, that is his own body, honorably or in honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. I mean, that's how they live. That's how they live. So don't do that. And in that area, you're going to show the distinctive, sparkling, pure quality of your life. And they'll look at you like you are Rip Van Winkle. Are you serious? You don't do that? You think that's wrong? This is the promise we make. Is God serious about it? The writer of Hebrews, if you turn a few pages more to the right, in chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled undefiled fornicators and adulterers that is those who refuse to repent of it live for it cherish it long for it God will what judge how many times do you hear people saying you know you shouldn't judge anybody you shouldn't be so judgmental so narrow you know, God ain't going to judge anybody for doing something they love or with somebody they say they love. And he says, any kind of sexual action outside of my defined structure of marriage, God will judge. God will judge. We've seen a lot of tinkering with the family over the past few decades, haven't we? Abortion on demand, cohabitation, which now outnumbers marriage licenses annually, no-fault divorce, same-sex parenting through surrogates or artificial insemination, all on and on, all of it just kind of whittling away and whittling away and whittling away and reducing and reducing and reducing and ultimately erasing the ideal of marriage and sexual purity as God designed it for our own good. One more promise. One more promise in relation to our personal conduct. 
to follow the ordinances of Scripture by being immersed in water, following conversion to Christ, and remembering and celebrating his atoning sacrifice through what we call communion. Now, we're putting this in the category of personal conduct issues because while the church administrates it, it isn't something the church forces. That activity is your personal desire to obey and follow and remember Christ. And when you fulfill these promises, you can be brought into the full and rich relationship with those in the church who've been identified as disciples of Jesus Christ as well. And by the way, let me tell you this. I've seen this change in the 30 years I've pastored. We are not making, as a body of believers, too much of baptism. We're trying to correct the faulty thinking of the church that makes it too little. Makes too little of it. The Lord said to his disciples in Matthew 28, if you have a question, you ought to go back to that text, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, in the process of going, I want you to make disciples. What's a disciple? A follower of Jesus Christ. Make disciples. Do two things to them. Baptize them and teach them. Now, I've never met a Christian who didn't think the church ought to be teaching or shouldn't be teaching. It ought to teach. I'm here because it teaches. It's important to be taught the Word of God. Good. What about baptism? That came first, and you can't draw a line through it and say one's important and the other one is not. This passage isn't a suggestion. These are commands to publicly identify outwardly with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through immersion in water baptism and then to be taught all that Christ taught us to obey. Now, according to the New Testament pattern, baptism is not something you do for your parents or that your parents do for you. It isn't even something you do for your church at 12 or 14 or 16 or 8 or whatever. It's something you decide to do for Christ as a statement of obedience. It's simply a living testimony. It demonstrates that you have believed the gospel. You believe that Jesus died for you, was buried for you, and rose again for you from the dead, which is why baptism by immersion is the biblical mode. The word means immerse. I'll say more about that in a moment. But immersion is the significant mode because it symbolizes what's taking place. It symbolizes death and burial we don't stop there. We believe in the resurrection, right? Amen. Sometimes we count slowly. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. No, we pull them up. We haven't lost anybody yet. Now, the word baptize means to immerse or dip. The Greeks were intelligent people. They had words for baptizing and pouring. None of them are ever used, not once, in passages related to Christian baptism. Why? Because you can't get the symbol out of anything other than the mode of immersion. That's why I have good Presbyterian and Methodist friends in Greece, and they all immerse. Why? Because they have a Greek New Testament that the people read. Unfortunately, the verb for English people is transliterated. Baptizomai is transliterated. Baptizim. We just created an English word. Nobody knows what it means. It means to immerse. Why is it transliterated? Why is a verb in the original language not touched in its translation but transliterated? Because it would have created a scandal when the English first English version occurred in the Middle Ages because the Catholic Church was sprinkling infants as a sacrament. So the verb was left alone and baptizomai was simply transliterated to create an English word, baptism, which still left people without knowing what it means. Which bothers me, by the way, more and more the older I get. It means to immerse. It's the only verb associated in any passage with Christian baptism. I shook the hand of a gentleman a few days ago who was one of the leaders on the committee of translating the ESV, and I didn't say it to him, but I wanted to say to him, why didn't you lead your committee to refuse the pressure of economy and, and, and publishers and marketing and translate that 
verb. I didn't say it. I said it on the way home in the mirror. It sounded really great, you know. I didn't say it to him. So what happened when the church was created, Acts 2? So those who received his word, those who believed the gospel message of Peter as this church is created, they were baptized. Wouldn't it be great if it had been translated? They were immersed, signifying their belief in the one who came and died and was buried and rose again. What a wonderful symbol. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So you have the church springing into existence suddenly with 3,000 people in Jerusalem making up the first local church. And they fulfilled effectively a promise to be identified with Christ in this ordinance. And we follow that practice to this day. The ordinance of baptism is a one-time event after your conversion. Don't pull it into your conversion as a definition within justification by faith alone, or you've created a work plus faith. It follows conversion to Christ as a statement of your belief in the gospel of Christ. There is another ordinance, one more ordinance that takes place as often as the leadership of the church plan the event. We call it communion. And again, we don't want to make too little of it. We want to make much of it. And so here in our church, if you've been around here long enough, you know whenever we have communion, we shut everything down. I don't preach my same series of messages. We stop it. We do a different devotion. We do a different subject related to the cross, the music. Everything is designed for that hour. You know, today you can buy now from the Christian bookstores and churches, do it, the little plastic cup that has a little thin... Uh, uh, covering and on top of that covering is a little wafer and then over that's another plastic covering and so you can just hand those out and then zip 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 and get it done in about you know 120 seconds that's not what we want to do we want to make much of it baptism is a one-time act of identification so when you learn more about Jesus you don't get baptized again you're gonna be learning more about him all the time it's a one-time act after your conversion of identification. Communion is an ongoing ordinance of examination. And I like to say rededication. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, but let a man examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's for believers. But it's a wonderful opportunity at that moment to rededicate yourself to the Lord to make sure that path is clean and clear. It isn't, a, it isn't a, a picture of sonship, it's a picture of fellowship for the sons and daughters of God. So this is a promise we make repeatedly and even collectively as we remember our Lord. You know what these personal promises do for us as it relates to our conduct? They, they cause us to revalue those things that have real value. Because out there in the world, they're always changing the price tags. They take purity and they say, that's not really worth all that much money. Let's just dumb that thing down. They take marriage. Oh, let's just dumb that thing down. Let's take fidelity. You know, you know, man's just an alpha male. Let him collect. Dumb it down. The church changes those price tags back to what they ought to be. And, and part of the message and part of the accountability and part of the promise that we have to each other and to our Lord is to constantly urge each other on to keep those price tags what they ought to be. I was sent this true story a few weeks ago from a member of our fellowship, and with this I'll close. A man in disheveled clothing sat at a metro station in Washington, D.C., playing his violin. It was a cold January morning, took place just a couple of years ago. He played several pieces by Bach, and his playing through the morning rush hour lasted just about 45 minutes. It was calculated that several thousand people walked past him as he played. One middle-aged man noticed the musician and stopped, looked, listened for just a moment, and then rushed away. Another one came and leaned against the wall and watched, listening, and then looked at his 
watch on his, his wristwatch and realized he had to take off and he left. The only person to pay the violinist any attention was a little boy who stopped to listen, fascinated. And even when his mother took his hand and urged him along, he kept his head turned back, watching as he was led away. In the 45 minutes this musician played, only six people stopped for a moment or two. Only 20 people of the thousands that walked by him, only 20 tossed some money into his violin case, which came to just at $32. And they didn't slow their pace when they did. When he finished playing and silence took over, no one noticed, no one applauded, no one recognized that this was Joshua Bell, one of the most famous violinists of our world. And he'd been playing on a violin worth $3.5 million. Now he had been under guard, unsuspecting to any of the audience that walked by. It was part of an experiment by the Washington Post to just do a little experiment on perception and priorities among people. You see, two days before he played in that subway, he had sold out Boston and the seats cost $100 a ticket. I couldn't help but think of this subject. Beloved, just because the world ignores you and just because the world doesn't applaud you, just because they don't hardly stop but every so often to listen to your message, what you have and what you are delivering is worth its weight in a city of gold. And, and these are our promises. Just remember, you, 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 you don't take your cues from what the world can perceive. You don't take your cues from what the world stops and says, oh, you got to listen to this. Or that's not worth listening to. You don't take your cues from the world. You take your cues from what God has already said. And so as it relates to our personal conduct, these are promises we're making to each other. This is our priority. This is the direction in which our toes are pointed. This is our passion. For the benefit of our own lives and God's goodness in so ordering it, for the benefit of our church and the gospel and ultimately to the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.